Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the security track down here. Uh, today we will hear a lot about different platforms, different architectures, uh, starting with ARM and Sandrine. Give a big round of applause for her. She will be speaking about secure partitions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so thank you for joining me today. So uh, I'm Sandrine Bayeux. I work at ARM, uh, more specifically in the Trusted Firmware A team. And today I would like to talk about uh, secure partitions. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to give you a brief overview of what the, the project is. So um, the, the aim of the project is really to provide a, a reference Im implementation of a firmware for the ARMv8 A platforms. Yeah, um, so um, as I was saying, the Trusted Firmware A project is uh, about providing reference uh, code for uh, the firmware on ARMv8 platforms. So on the right, you've got a picture of how a typical um, software stack might look like on, on, uh, on an ARMv8 A platforms. So um, this is showing a device that would have the trust zone technology, where the world is divided into two parts. You've got uh, the normal world that, uh, on, on, on the left, which is running uh, all your um, normal applications, your uh, operating system like Linux, and potentially your hypervisor. And on the other side, uh, side, you have the trusted world where you run all your uh, secure payloads. So you might have some trusted applications running on top of a trusted OS. And at the very bottom, uh, we have a trusted firmware A, which is running at EL3. That's the, most um, the highest level of privileged of on, a, on, a, on an ARMv8 uh, platform. And so um, the, the, the aim is really to provide a foundation for people to for people to build uh, such a, a trusted execution environment. The project, uh, the code is designed as much as possible uh, to be, um, to be uh, reused and to be easily ported to uh, new platforms. Uh, it's an open source project, uh, otherwise wouldn't be there. Uh, it's available on, uh, on GitHub and distributed under a BSD3 closed license. And uh, the project was created about five years ago. I, I believe it's um, the anniversary is this month. And uh, so over the years, it's got some, some tractions from partners. We've got about uh, 30 platform ports available uh, today uh, in the upstream. So I wanted to, to list some of the main features of the Trusted Firmware A. So obviously, being the, most, uh, the, the first piece of software that runs on your platform in the trusted world, it has to, to boot everything and to initialize your secure devices. It's got a modular boot flow where um, it, it, the, the firmware is divided into several images. The a ROM firmware, RAM firmware, um, uh, a persistent RAM firmware that provides some, uh, some runtime services. So you don't have to use all of these images. You can pick some of them only and potentially replace uh, others by your own implementation if you have different needs. Um, it supports a uh, trusted boot where um, every firmware image authenticates the next one before executing it. So you build a, a chain of trust from the very first piece of uh, firmware. Um, also, it's, um, since we have this concept of normal world and secure world, uh, sometimes you've got to, to do some transition between the two. So that's, uh, that's the trusted firmware handling this uh, world switch. You can integrate the trusted firmware with, uh, with a trusted OS. We support a number of popular ones. Uh, this is done by implementing a, a piece of, of, um, of code in the, in the firmware to basically uh, intercept all the requests that are uh, targeted to this trusted OS and, and forward them and to, to, to the trusted OS. It supports a, a recovery mode in case your device is bricked and uh, you need to update the firmware. Uh, and also, much like UEFI, it provides some runtime services, so it, it's, it stays in, in memory at runtime once your OS is booted, and uh, the OS can make some calls into the firmware. Uh, one of these services is, for example, uh, power management. Um, so I said that the code is available on GitHub. Uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce uh, trustedfirmware.org, which is uh, which in a couple of months uh, will be the place where the code will be available. 
just about where the code is available. It's a kind of a new era for us uh, because the project is, is, uh, will become soon a Linaro uh, community project uh, that will uh, host both the Trusted Firmware A but also its counterpart for uh, M-class devices, the Trusted Firmware M. Uh, the M-class devices are microcontroller space. Um, and uh, this project will be operated uh, independently from the main Linaro organization. There will be a, a, a board of members, so anyone really can join the, 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 the board, and uh, whether they are a Linaro member or not. And uh, the benefits uh, to being a member is that uh, you'll be able to piggyback on the infrastructure provided by Linaro, for example, to, to get your board integrated into their board farm so that, it's, uh, so that the, the firmware is continuously um, tested uh, against regression um, and, um, and potentially uh, also influence the, the direction of, of the project for the new features and everything. So if you want to know more about that, uh, please go to trustedformer.org or contact uh, board at trustedformer.org. So now uh, let's delve into the, the heart of the subject. Um, so uh, what I want to talk about uh, is very much related to the challenges that people face today into the trusted world. Um, before I start, just a, before I start, just as a disclaimer, um, this is kind of a hot topic. It's something we are currently working on that we've been working on for some time. Um, so it's, uh, it's still, nothing is set, set in stone yet. Um, things might evolve, um, both on the uh, specification side of it and also in, on the implementation side of it. But uh, hopefully I can give you a, um, an overview of the concepts and uh, why we're doing that and how we are going to do it. So one of the challenges that people face today in um, the trusted world uh, stack is that uh, the MV8 architecture, um, I mentioned trust zone that provides you the separation between normal world and trusted world. And the concept is really that the software running in normal world uh, cannot, uh, cannot interfere with the, the software in, in, uh, in trusted world. So it cannot, uh, for example, it cannot access secure memory, secure devices. Uh, so there is a nice separation there. But beyond that, we don't really get any isolation uh, in particular. Um, so here on this diagram, um, we see uh, the trusted firmware A running at the highest privileged um, in EL3. And uh, the trusted OS is typically running at uh, secure EL1. And uh, there is no proper isolation between EL3 and secure L1 be between the firmware and between uh, the, the trusted OS. So that means that uh, EL3 and secure L1 both have basically the same level of access to the memory, uh, memory space. They can access any memory they, they, they want, and they also get direct access to the physical interrupts. So, um, as a consequence, you have the, the, these um, orange arrows that I've drawn, um, is uh, the interactions that can happen. So, the firmware in ER3 is, not, is ne uh, never really isolated from the trusted OS. If you've got uh, several components inside your firmware, they are not isolated from each other. And the, also, the, the normal world uh, cannot be protected from the trusted OS in secure EL1. And there have been some attacks in the past where people would leverage some bu bug in some trusted OS implementation in order to access the normal world and do some privilege escalation attacks. So that is a, a real problem. Uh, the second challenge is um, that the software stack is very much fragmented. So here the, we have a picture again of uh, the same uh, software stack. I've just put some colors to uh, identify um, who provides the code and uh, the dependencies. Um, so let's start first with the uh, green boxes. Um, so these are, these are all the um, trusted OS specific things. So unfortunately, um, there, when you have a a particular uh, for a platform uh, that some uh, dependencies on other software components. Um, although there are some, some, some standardization at the application level to communicate with the uh, uh, operating system, the standardization doesn't go beyond that. So uh, if, you got, if you've got a particular 
trusted OS, you've got to have the uh, corresponding trusted OS driver in your operating system and potentially in your hypervisor as well if you have one, in order to be able to communicate with this trusted OS. And uh, the same goes also in the ER3 firmware. You've got to have some kind of dispatcher that will basically um, intercept all the requests um, uh, for this particular trusted OS and forward them in a trusted OS specific manner uh, to secure your one. So, so yeah. Um, the, um, the other thing is that um, the code is coming from different vendors. So obviously there's the trusted OS vendor, like I just uh, explained, but um, potentially th there is also some code provided by the silicone vendor. Uh, if, uh, if you need to access to uh, some particular uh, trusted hardware resources, you most, uh, most probably will need some driver into the ER3 firmware and into the trusted OS. And the fact that um, there is no proper isolation between the trusted OS and the firmware, and that, and that it's provided by different vendors, means that uh, these people have to tr trust each other. These software images has to cooperate to some degree, and um, that, that, that's an issue. So the solution that ARM proposes is to introduce virtualization in the trusted world. So maybe you've heard that uh, there's a new version of the architecture coming, ARM v8.4, and that will give us uh, secure virtualization extensions uh, with a, a new exception level, uh, which is uh, secure EL2. And that will allow us to run some firmware code at this exception level. And uh, it will be very similar to the uh, counterpart, I mean, the EL2 in the normal world where you, people um, uh, use a, run a, a hypervisor at the moment. So that means that the hypervisor will, uh, I mean, sorry, the secure EL2 firmware will be able to uh, restrain access to the physical memory uh, for the uh, trusted OSs because um, trusted OSs will no longer access directly to physical memory, instead they will access to intermediate physical addresses that are then uh, uh, translated by a second stage of the MMU by the uh, Secure EL2 firmware. So you've got two stages like that, and, uh, and so the Secure EL2 firmware can control like that exactly what physical memory is accessed by uh, the trusted OS. And the uh, same for the physical interrupts, uh, they will be routed to Secure EL2 instead of the Secure EL1. So that means that the Secure EL2 con firmware controls them, and if it deems that uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, an interrupt that it, would, um, that it need to forward to the uh, trusted OS, it can re-inject it as a virtual interrupt into the uh, trusted OS. So these are all the hardware features that we'll get with ARMv8.4, but of course we also need a software architecture to leverage all of this. And uh, that's where the secure partitions uh, would, uh, would, uh, would play a role. So um, a secure partition uh, in this context uh, is a software sandbox uh, that runs in trusted world. Uh, so it's a sandbox, that means that it's isolated from other secure partitions in the system and from, from all, of, all other software entities. Um, and it's, it runs at the low privilege exception level uh, under the control of higher privilege uh, software. And the aim is really to, uh, for a secure partition to provide secure services. So, to, just to illustrate, give you a bit better idea of what a secure service is, um, you may think about uh, platform-specific uh, services. Think about uh, RAS error handling, so that uh, um, when you, you've got um, um, a hardware error, like a memory corruption, something. Um, um, it might be fatal, uh, you might not be able to recover from this, uh, from this error, but you might at least be able to um, read some platform-specific register that will give you a bit more information about uh, wh how this error occurred, in what circumstances, uh, and build an error report, a report. So that's something you could do, you could implement in a secure service. You could also have uh, device-specific services. Uh, if, you, if, if you've got some uh, cryptographic hardware on your platform, you might want to have a dedicated secure service that um, controls uh, this uh, cryptographic hardware, and all the, the rest of the software attack would have to interface with this secure service uh, to access the cryptographic hardware behind it. 
So these are two examples of uh, quite hardware-related um, uh, uh, secure services, but you can also have of, um, some higher level services to implement uh, protocols like uh, secure storage, secure payment, or uh, secure firmware update updates. And um, all of these secure services and secure partitions uh, are meant to be uh, independent of any uh, operating system, because remember one of the challenges in the trusted world is really that we have this dependency on the trusted OS. So uh, by standardizing the communication interfaces uh, between the secure partition and the rest of the world, uh, we, we would remove this, uh, this dependency. Um, now, so this is how the world would look like uh, with secure partitions. So uh, in the green boxes, uh, you've got two examples of secure partitions. So the first one is, uh, let's say it's a simple one that uh, would run both in uh, secure EL0 and uh, secure EL1. But you can also have more complex um, uh, trust secure partition that uh, encapsulate a whole trusted OS uh, and its trusted applications. So, and you may have as many secure partitions uh, as you want in your system. So obviously you need some kind of uh, entity that manages all of them. So that's the, uh, in the yellow box, the secure partition manager. So that's the bit of code that would run at secure yield 2. And uh, conceptually, it's very similar to uh, a hypervisor that would uh, manage I its guest uh, operating systems. Um, and uh, the secure partition manager is provided uh, by the Trusted Firmware A project. Um, and um, we, uh, the project will also continue to ship the ER3 firmware as well, obviously. Now, this is, so unfortunately, RMV804 is not there yet. Uh, so for the time being, we don't have any secure yield 2 we don't have any secure virtualization. So um, that, that's, um, that's how uh, the software stack currently uh, looks like. So we, uh, since uh, there is no secure yield 2 the secure partition manager currently runs at EL3. Uh, and it's part of the, really the same binary as the, trusty, the rest of the trusted firmware A. And uh, the secure partition run at uh, secure EL0 because, as I said, there is no proper isolation between EL3 and secure EL1, so we don't want to put secure partition at secure EL1, otherwise that kind of defeats the purpose of secure partitions. Um, so and we just have a bit of glue code, uh, this other yellow box. Um, um, it's just because um, architecturally it's not possible for secure EL0 code to call directly into EL3 code. Uh, the, the way you do that usually is by executing an SMC instruction, secure monitor call. That's, n that's an undefined instruction for secure EL0. So we've just got a bit of glue code that relay uh, uh, SVCs that, um, sorry, secure EL0 code can make a supervisor call into secure EL1. So we just have a bit of glue code that we relay SVCs into SMCs. And that, um, that uh, software architecture enables us to start um, implementing SPM with the current architecture. Now, I just wanted to give a bit more detail about some of the uh, implementation details of Secure Partition, uh, mostly around their runtime model. So obviously, um, uh, a secure partition provides some secure services. So we need a way for the other pieces of software to request these services. So we need some kind of communication model. Uh, so we've implemented a client-server model, where in this context, the server is a, a secure service. And the client can be uh, either running in the normal world, so it could be your uh, bootloader or your operating system, but it can also be another secure service in case you have some dependencies between secure partition. Uh, earlier, I was talking about a secure service that would drive your cryptographic hardware. In this case, that will probably uh, th that might um, involve a, a dependency on um, another secure partition that would like to implement uh, secure storage, for example. Um, and um, so in terms of implementation, uh, um, a secure servi service is really just um, a, a passive bit of code that waits for something to do. So it's just a loop that waits for some input, and when, when it receives some, some, some work to do, it just processes it, and, and then that's forever. 
And for every communication between a client and a secure partition, uh, everything goes through the uh, secure partition manager. Uh, and one important thing also is that uh, we want um, we, we want as much as possible that uh, the normal world software stays in charge of uh, scheduling. What I mean by that is that we, we, we don't want um, the uh, secure service for execute to, to execute for a very long period of time uh, because that would result in a, in a blackout uh, from the point of view of the of your Linux kernel, for example. So if you've got your scheduler in Linux that is trained to take the best decisions, uh, you know, uh, on what what application to to um, to schedule, um, having the secure world stealing all the, secu the sorry having the trusted world. Uh, stealing all the CPU cycles like that would mess up everything. Um, so it's really for the, if the normal world uh, thinks that um, some service is taking too long to, uh, to complete, uh, it can always interrupt it. That might not be the case in all, um, it's not the only model that we will support, but that we see that as the, um, the, 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 the main one. Um, so, as I said at the beginning, um, one of the issue is really uh, one of the issues in the trusted world is really that uh, we don't have any standard. Um, so um, the, one of our aims is to standardize all these uh, communication interfaces. So ARM is introducing two new specifications, uh, which uh, one for the clients to request some services, so that the secure partition client interface or SPCI. And for uh, and another uh, standard uh, standard is for uh, secure partitions to actually handle the requests that they receive from clients. So that would be uh, standardized by standardized by the secure partition runtime or SPRT. Um, so. Uh, these, these specifications are still under development at the moment, and uh, the aim is for the Trusted Firmware project to provide a reference implementation of, this, um, of these uh, standards. And this is still under development as well. So the, the SPCI is really uh, just a collection of ABIs for uh, clients to, uh, to, um, to discover the secure services that are available on your platform. Uh, each service basically has a unique ID, so the clients, um, th that's how they refer to uh, a secure service. Uh, the secure partition manager uh, basically um, keeps a um, kind of a registry or a database of all the secure partition IDs in the system and in wi by which partition this is implemented so that it can um, re um, forward the request to the, to the right partition. Um, the SPCI also uh, obviously allow uh, clients to establish a communication channel with uh, uh, a given uh, secure service when it's been identified and uh, exchange messages uh, with this secure service. And uh, if there is a um, kind of a big payload to attach to this request, there is a possibility to uh, share some memory between the client and the secure uh, uh, partition to, to put uh, the payload uh, inside. And on the other hand, the SPRT is uh, again a collection of ABIs for uh, the design provided to secure partitions. Uh, that's implemented by the SPM again, and uh, it, it allows secure partitions to retrieve client requests, to send responses back to them, and to receive to receive any interrupts that would be targeted to this uh, secure partition. Either some uh, some interrupts. Uh, potentially you might have a secure service that handles the device, so it would own all the interrupts of this device, or it can also be some uh, inter-process communication between the secure partitions if they want to send interrupts to each other. Uh, and the, um, the uh, SPRT, the, this runtime model, is really uh, there to provide a frame for people to, um, to uh, implement secure services on top. So it eases the development of secure services, and it also improves the robustness and the security of secure services, since uh, people don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, from the beginning every time, so um, remove some of the uh, usual mistakes that they could made, make in the, in the implementation. So um, hopefully this gives you um, an idea of um, why we are uh, working on that and um, what we are trying to achieve and how we are going, going to implement that. I've put a few links uh, to have a look at your leisure, uh, mainly to the Trusted Firmware 
A code. And also, um, the last link is a, is a white paper from, from ARM that uh, basically talks about uh, what I just uh, presented in uh, more details. So if you want to know more, I invite you to have a look at this one. Do you have any questions? Uh, hi. hi. So uh, my main question about this uh, architecture extension with the secure EL2 is um, essentially why don't you just have the secure server, because there's already a separation between secure EL0 and EL1, right? So why can't you just yes. only have the secure services in EL0 and have a common implementation of secure EL1 that could be part of trusted firmware or could be another ARM project and then have your common ABI between EL0 and EL1 and then you wouldn't, like right now, you essentially have two layers of isolation where I think you only want one, right? Right, yeah. Um, so the, the main issue is that, yeah, I should have said it. Um, so people want, at the moment, um, so I should go back to the, one of the diagrams just to illustrate that. Um, so at the moment, oops, let's take this one, yeah. Um, most of the time, uh, people only put one trusted OS into their software stack because it, it is possible to have multiple trusted OSs, but it's kind of difficult. They, they have to cooperate with, with each other. And so uh, if, you, if, if we were to implement it the, the way you said, uh, basically, so we would need to have some, one of the, if you have two trusted OSs, you would need to have one of them that implement the, 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 the standard for, for, the, for the rest. And uh, so it wouldn't be very scalable uh, because it will again introduce the, uh, the this uh, this problem of um, of um, standardization. So um, yeah, the, the, this is the aim is really to to have a more scalable uh, software stack in the trusted world where you can have uh, multiple trusted OSCs uh, sitting uh, alongside uh, um, secure partition that that do not have anything to do with uh, trusted OSs. So that's why you have to kind of have uh, something at a higher uh, exception privilege uh, that um, manages everyone, basically. Uh, okay. But, uh, sorry, uh, so right now, um, is, is there anything you actually gain from having more than one trusted OS? Because couldn't you just have one trusted OS that's maybe developed from ARM that all vendors could use? Uh, so ARM don't uh, develop any trusted OS. And we, we will not. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, um, pe people want to be able to have uh, several trusted OSs um, on the same platforms. Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, they've said it uh, to us. Uh, it's um, mainly for OEMs when, when they integrate uh, all, all the software on their, sta on their stack. Um, they, they may be interested in having several uh, trusted OSs. OK, thanks. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I have two questions. Like, first is, can you tell like what are the top business cases for having mul multiple trusted OSs, um, or top cases for trustlets? And um, last year, Google Zero Project announced uh, problems with revocation of trustlets. Can you let us know uh, what would be the procedure for revocation in new cases? and how it works uh, from our pers arm perspective. Right. Uh, so for the per first part of the question about uh, having multiple trusted OSs, uh, to be honest, I, I, don't, uh, I, don't, very, uh, I don't know, uh, because uh, I, I would imagine that different trusted OSs provide uh, different services, but I've never really uh, looked at uh, what kind of services. Uh, I know that trusted OSs are mainly used on uh, mobile devices, uh, it's not so much to, to targeted towards uh, the server market, for example. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so trustless. So, do you mean a trusted application running running on uh, right? So about uh, revocating the, the, these. Like, uh, you mean if uh, one of them is a, um, has a vulnerability inside it, uh, right? But in this case. Uh, as long as you don't have any vulnerability in your trusted OS, 
um, if uh, if you've got one in the trusted application, that shouldn't do much damage, right? I mean, if they they because the trusted OS uh, controls all the, um, the the resources that every application can can access. So um, I'm I'm not too sure about uh, the the. Okay, uh, you assume that trusted OS would be um, not vulnerable, but if it would be vulnerable, what's then? Yeah. Okay. So if the trusted OS is vulnerable, yeah, that, that's another issue. Uh, so, um, so with SecureL2, again, we would have a, a, a higher privilege exception level that can control that. But again, you can have a bug in SecureL2, but, um, but then you can make a case for, uh, of that for, for, for every piece of software, I guess. And, um, yeah, but, uh, but in case of um, your, your virtualization layer, uh, as I believe we should not care much about that, but more problem uh, we probably will have with trusted OSs and trustless because those are deployed by multiple vendors, uh, which may not care to harden that so much as you hardening your firmware layer, which have to cooperate with various trusted OSs. So, so still the question is open, like how we revoke applications which are inside phone um, and, and in the field, like we have like millions of phones there and mm -hmm. what's them? So I think it's more of a, um, this is an issue, I would say that the trusted OS itself would have to handle in any case. Um, I, it's really implementation specific, I guess. Um, I, I'm just giving you m my, uh, I mean, I, I don't know for sure, okay? Uh, I'm just uh, extrapolating. Uh, I think that um, if, you, if you want to be able to revoke your applications, you need to implement some kind of, uh, of uh, signature in your application and perhaps uh, having a, um, um, a, registry, a registry in your trusted OS of uh, w what application you trust and which one you don't and, and you can always revoke uh, applications uh, there. But I don't think it's, a, it's a something that concerns Secure EL2 or EL3 firmware. I think it would be handled at uh, higher um, stacks. Yeah, I, I think that one of the problems is that, is that for example, some main, main vendors of, of trusted OSs just don't have the path for that. Mm. So that's the case. And that's what Google <coughs> Zero Project pointed, like uh, July 2017. Okay. Yeah. But the trusted OS is part of the static firmware, so you just replace it if it's broken. Uh, yes, you can replace it, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's, um, it's loaded anyway by, uh, by the... Uh, by the firmware, so yeah, you can always have a to have the um, firmware enter the, uh, some recovery mode where it would uh, um, update the, the 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 trusted OS uh, on on secure storage. Yeah. Yeah. So I have another question. So holding the mic, so I'll just. <laughs> so you were talking about scheduling blackouts before. Yeah. Um, can you explain maybe? If it doesn't take too much time, how that works actually, if, for instance, if you do uh, uh, call into a secure, a secure partition from a guest OS on the non-secure side mm -hmm. and its time slice runs out, how does that get scheduled out and back right. in again? Because yeah. it's kind of inverted from the, uh, from the normal mm -hmm. scheduling case. So the idea is for um, is that secure partitions are interruptible by uh, normal world interrupts. So you can have um, you can have your uh, operating system uh, programming some kind of timer interrupts, um, and th um, which makes sure that it fires every uh, every every um, fixed amount of time. So if 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 a secure service is taking too long to run, it would just get interrupted by the timer and uh, th th that would, uh, that would um, I mean, the interrupt would be uh, targeted to uh, the, your operating system, uh, which would then uh, choose or not to choose uh, um, resuming the, uh, the request of the secure service, or if it doesn't want to, then it doesn't have to. So it schedules, um, so the hypervisor reschedules it, does that mean that the call from the secure petition has to return first, then it gets rescheduled and then the call is like restarted or? Well, so um, the, 
so the, 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 your secure service would be running, okay? And uh, at, at this time, you've got a, a timer interrupt that fires. Uh, automatically, uh, because we've configured the right routing model uh, inside the, the, the general, general interrupt uh, controller, the geek, um, this interrupt would automatically um, stop execution of the secure service. And, uh, and then, um, because the interrupt is targeted towards the... Um, operating system, that's where it would be delivered and you would basically enter your vector interrupt in, inside your, uh, uh, your um, operating system. So then uh, the operating system can figure out that the, uh, it had made a request to, uh, uh, to a secure service uh, and uh, it, it can figure out that uh, it has been interrupted and so it, it, it is free then to um, resume this request later on uh, or do some urgent work first and, um, and, uh, and do it much later. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so you don't actually contact switch the state inside the secure partition. So you don't have re-entrant calls into the secure partition. You, uh... No, we don't have any re-entrancy, but we would still, I mean, yeah, uh, there's a step that I forgot. Yeah, you're right. You've, you've got to at least um, save the, the, the state of uh, the secure partition, you know, enable to, to resume it. Uh, that, that would be done by the ER3 firmware just before um, um, forwarding the interrupt to the uh, normal world. Yeah, sorry. Hi, nice Hi. talk. If you, if I understood you correctly, that requires new hardware features. Mm -hmm. At what, in what core will they be available? So it will be in the uh, in the core ARM V8 uh, architecture. So all cores. But uh, I, the only thing I'm not sure about is whether these um, hardware extensions will be optional or not. I, 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 they probably will. Uh, you know, in the ARM V8 architecture. Um, uh, so we, we often have uh, new revisions, and every time they introduce new features, and some of them are mandatory to implement. So if you want to have a V8.4 uh, architecture, then that means you implement these, 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 these features, and um, that gives some, some guarantee to the software that they are here. Um, and some of them are optional, so um, I'll provide some guidance about uh, how to implement them, but uh, people don't have to actually implement them to claim that they are V8.4. Um, so I'm not entirely sure whether the secure extension are mandatory or um, optional, but in any case that would uh, concern any ARM V8 core, uh, so all the Cortex-A that, um, that are ARM V8.4 compliant. Current Cortex A seventy two is not eight point four. It's, no, it's not. eight point whatever. Yeah. So when will we have an eight point four ah okay capable when? core from ARM? Okay. So the um, the extensions. I mean the the ARM V eight point four specification. So I mean the the document published by ARM, uh, that should uh, be available sometime around October. But then uh, ARM doesn't implement uh, any um, ARM V8.4 uh, uh, cores itself. Uh, some people uh, might in the future, but uh, I, I don't know exactly. Uh. Um, on your pre V8.4 uh, design about secure partition manager, which is running secure EL1. Where does your trusted device is running to? Uh, so let me just go back to this. Where you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, on this one. So where do, where does your trusted device is sitting? Right. Yeah. Uh, so in uh, in this model, uh, you can't really have any trusted OS. Uh, that's the thing. Our recommendation is to not have any trusted OS on the current Cortex A. Well, if you, if you want, you, you cannot have um, in, in in the current architecture. architecture sorry, you cannot have um, partitions running at secure year zero alongside with uh, some trusted OS uh, because you, you you don't have the the isolation, like I said, between secure year one and year three. So that's uh, I mean it's possible, but then you you don't have a. It's kind of a fake, right? Because uh, um, because it cannot defeat the purpose. So, yeah, that's why there is no trusted OS there, yeah. But, uh, th yeah, uh, with V8.4, obviously, all of that uh, becomes uh, yeah, possible. And 
quick question about uh, ourtrustedfirmware.org. You mentioned the code we move to uh, to the website. Mm -hmm. Does it mean it will uh, it will not be on GitHub anymore? Um, so I believe the plan is really yeah uh, that it won't be available on GitHub anymore. At the moment, uh, we've got the main code on GitHub and we've already got a mirror of that on trustedfirmware.org. So you can already go there and there's the code both for the trusted firmware A and the trusted firmware M. Uh, but uh, in the in the coming uh, month, uh, everything will. The plan is really to move everything there. Uh, the review, uh, the code, uh, everything, the, the, having our uh, build infrastructure more open as well. Um, yeah. But to be as open source as now? Yeah. Okay. Finish. Um, just as we just discussed, oh, sorry, as we just discussed, um, MV8.4 is quite a while. Quite some time to go. We are currently at ARM v8.2. There are implementations out. You started out at the first slide of your old slide deck, talk, and also including ARM v7. Mm -hmm. um, is trusted firmware A only about ARM v8, or is there a version, or can I somehow compile it for ARM v7? Uh, it, yeah, it also it's also it also supports ARM v, ARM v7 platform. Yeah, it does. Uh, yeah, I mainly talked about uh, ARMv8, uh, ARMv8 platforms because that, that is our main focus. But there was some traction from, for, from people to have it for ARMv7 as well. So, yeah. Uh, it's yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. V7 yeah. or uh, 32-bit V8? Both. Both. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, uh, thanks, Sandrine. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you.